This is Jason Anderson, Chairman of Killingly Town Council, and we're calling this regular town council meeting to order. Today is June 13th, 2023, and it's currently 7.01 p.m. Um, for prayer, Ms. Wakefield, could you please? For roll call purposes, all council members are in attendance except for Mr. Wood and Mr. Cotula, who are both absent with notification. At this time, we'll move on to item 5A, adoption of minutes of previous meetings. 5A is special town council meeting, May 2nd, 2023. 5B is regular town council meeting, May 9th, 2023. And 5C is special town council meeting, May 11th, 2023. Can I get a motion to adopt these? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Ms. Wakefield, second by Ms. George. Discussion, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Next item up on the agenda is item six, presentations, proclamations, and declarations. Up first is 6A. Which is a proclamation recognizing the month of June 2023 as post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD Awareness Month, whereas post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, can occur after a person experiences trauma, including but not limited to the stress of combat, bombings, child abuse, sexual assault, accidents, and major terrifying events, and affects approximately 8 million adults in the United States. And whereas PTSD is associated with chemical changes in the body's hormonal system, an autumnic nervous system, and is characterized by symptoms including flashbacks, nightmares, insomnia, hypervigilance, anxiety, and depression. And whereas in the U.S., 6.8% of adults will experience PTSD in their lifetimes. Veterans are at higher risk of experiencing PTSD. PTSD affects men, women, and children. And whereas PTSD is treatable, many cases of PTSD remain undiagnosed and untreated due to lack of awareness of the condition and the persistent stigma associated with mental health conditions. And whereas raising awareness of this condition is necessary to remove the stigma, and to encourage those suffering to seek proper and timely treatment that may save their lives. All citizens suffering from PTSD deserve our consideration, and those who are affected due to wounds protecting our freedom deserve our respect and special honor. And whereas in 2014, the United States Senate designated the month of June as PTSD Awareness Month, now therefore be it proclaimed that the, town count, the Killingly Town Council does hereby recognize June 2023 as Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Awareness Month. To bring awareness to those with PTSD and to encourage people to reach out to their fellow citizens to provide support and remove the stigma associated with this disorder. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 13th day of June, 2023. We'll now move on to item 6B, a proclamation recognizing the month of June, 2023 as National Pollinator Month. Whereas pollinator species such as birds, butterflies, bees, and other insects are essential partners in producing much of our food supply and are threatened because of habitat loss, pesticides, and diseases, constituting a threat that affects the viability of native plant communities and our very food systems. And whereas pollinator species provide significant environmental benefits that are necessary for maintaining healthy, biodiverse, rural, urban, and suburban ecosystems. And whereas for decades, the town of Killingly has managed public landscapes and many municipal parks and greenways, as well as wildlife habitats. And whereas the town of Killingly endorses and supports the Killingly Community Garden and Mother Nature's Garden of Killingly. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the Killingly Town Council does hereby recognize June 2023 as National Pollinator Month to bring awareness of pollinators and encourage people to reach out to their fellow citizens 
to provide support for this cause. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 13th day of June 2023. Next item on the agenda is 6C, presentation by Any Edge LLC. Oh. And she was just leaving when I came in. Is your microphone turned on? Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay. Tom Thank Quinn you. here on behalf of Any Edge uh, in consideration of a host fee agreement with the town of Killingly to construct a um, three building data center uh, campus. Um, and uh, there's uh, something we should just talk about for a minute on the uh, host fee agreement, which is what we're here for tonight. Uh, the host fee agreement is designed as a starting st first step for a process that has approximately 15 steps to be able to get something approved. It's just the hall pass to be able to uh, move on from there. Some of the other steps are in process, so you understand what we're going to have to work through our inland wetlands, phase one and phase two environmental, archaeological, traffic studies, A2 surveys, geotechnical studies, sound readings for sound attenuation stormwater runoff planning, planning and zoning, of course, and conservation. We'd have to go through deep, Pura, FERC, architectural uh, uh, design and approval, DECD approval, uh, bonding for the entire project, uh, and then a building permit before we could do any construction. It's going to be a lengthy process, uh, but I wanted you to get some general scope about what this is all about. This. Uh, uh, if the town allows us to proceed, this is the uh, basically the financial document and agreement on the um, on the uh, host fee agreement. A couple of main points before we do another, we'll go through this PowerPoint. Uh, is uh, it's going to be a clean, all electric data center. There will be no generators of any kind, whether they're diesel or gas of any type. There are no generators on the site at all. It's all going to be run electrically. Sound attenuation. We will be at or less than ambient sounds on this site. We are working with a company in Ontario now that builds uh, actual structures that go over these gener these uh, air conditioning units rather on the on the rooftops, uh, and are very effective in major cities. Uh, and they work through high rises and data centers, uh, and um, and it'll all be engineered. You'll have all the reports every every step of the way. The town will be looking at what we're doing. And, um, and we'll be able to work our way through the uh, sound attenuation, but it will be ambient or less. Um, closed loop uh, air conditioning systems, very important. We're not gonna be using an evaporative system where it uses you know, uh, thousands, if not more gallons of water. It's all a closed loop system, similar to what you might have in a forced hot water house uh, type design. It's not anywhere near exactly that, but it's that same concept where it's a closed uh, loop system. The unused land, if we have any left, we do have to provide for stormwater runoff and so forth. Uh, we have uh, talked to uh, conservation about and we will uh, donate any of the portion of the unused land that we uh, don't think we need in, in the course of the development process. There may not be much, there may be 15 or 20 acres, we don't know exactly yet until we get through the process. Um, but any land that we don't have, we'd be happy to annex with the current conservation area. Um, we have a pretty low impact site. I've been around through the industrial park area uh, and, and, and the roads in and around there. We know there's a lot of trucks and a lot of action and so forth, but once this building's built, uh, we're averaging approximately for the square footage that we're proposing, approximately 80 full-time um, 
jobs in there. It could be as many as 100, but it's likely to be 80. That means 27 cars, only 27 cars per eight-hour shift. So it won't be a big, and there won't be many for trucks, except every two or three years, there'll be a, a few months where there, you'll see tractor trailers coming with server replacements and so forth. <clears throat> Waste was something that we talked about earlier. I want to just go through this with you. No cardboard. Cardboard came up. Any cardboard's brought off site. It'll be uh, all recycled and, and away from Killingly. The computers <clears throat> and all of the switch gear for the computers are all recyclable. And I gave the town, um, <clears throat> town manager a, uh, a, a, a single piece of paper, but there are brokers out there that actually come and buy all of this product, and it's all recycled at a, at a pretty high level. Uh, okay, so if we have the, do you have that yet? Oh, next one over, there we go. <clears throat> First picture just shows you what a data center hall could look like. This is what it is. Those are racks, and inside those racks, they look like DVR size. Uh, oh, if any of you still have DVRs, uh, they look like DVR size, and they slide into these racks, and it's a fairly standardized system, although the way they connect the racks with each other is a little more complicated. Every business is different, but that's just a photo. Um, what is, you can go to the next slide, please. What is a hyperscale data center? So what the heck are these guys going to bring to town, okay? A hyperscale data center is different than a regular data center in that it provides cloud services. It has a different type of server in it generally. Now, with the invent of AI, Amazon has announced just this past week that they're going to have to start replacing billions of dollars worth of servers. This would all be new to the latest, um, uh, latest type of server uh, use. So a hyperscale data center is a big box building with computers in it like you saw, very secure, extremely clean. Um, the, um, the cooling system is on the roof. Uh, there will be, as I said, no generators outside, so there's none of that noise associated with it. There is no vibration of any kind. It's a big box building with servers. Uh, the people that I work with to do this uh, work for us put examples include autonomous, autonomous vehicles. They put that first. That's way down on the list, actually. AI development, online consumer shopping, scientific research, but it's a whole lot more than that. It's everything from your phone to Netflix to storage to gaming to all of those services. In a general region where a hyperscale data, as opposed to a data center, operates, your connectivity comes way forward. You'll, you'll be able to connect much faster. The latency effect uh, it, uh, takes over. Who are the people that could come here? It's on the list. Hyperscale companies. Examples are Microsoft, uh, Azure, Google, Facebook, and uh, and there are others that would come in, ma major companies that could come in. On top of that, the second tier hyperscale companies like Oracle, uh, IBM, Apple, LinkedIn, Twitter, all those companies are listed. And there's another 20 beyond that or more. But there will also be some part of the building or one of the buildings we propose It would be a co-location like a digital or Equinix that would do things like MedTech. Uh, 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 storage, which most of it in almost all of it in New England leaves New England. Uh, there would be um, uh, university type storage, possibly defense storage uh, in this region, um, and a number of other types. Of course, we're at the insurance capital of the world. All of their all of their information is out uh, out west. So this would give uh, other opportunities, uh, perhaps in one of those three buildings. To the next page, if we could please. So this is just a quick background. All those blue, blue, blue states all have data deals. You see, Connecticut doesn't have the blue, but we since have voted in in Connecticut. And the deal is that you need to you need to uh, have some tax incentives because these servers are so expensive and they need to be replaced so often. It'd be like buying a car and replacing the tires every thousand miles. It's, it gets to be very pricey, so they need those those tax incentives to be able to uh, get past some of that. You can go to the next one, please. Okay, important for the industry and the people that we're talking to in the industry is that it is located between New York and Boston. Roughly 10% of the United States population is in a much smaller circle than you see up there. The, uh, the um, uh, energy that is needed uh, is available in the reason. The compute is available because we have main trunk fiber on 95, which connects us, connects us to the entire East Coast and overseas lines. 
Um, and this just gives you a little bit more about um, uh, that there are no opportunities anywhere in New England. Uh, we have spent some time uh, up at the Capitol, and they consider this a very important project for infrastructure for Connecticut. I expect there will be a few, not more than just a few, hyperscale data centers in Connecticut as years progress. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, why we're here in Killingly and not somewhere else. These are the four critical requirements of cited data center. Utility available, quantities, and competitive pricing. This also includes the fact that the site we're in has power running through it, very important. Um, it's also near 395 with fiber and dark fiber. It, it abuts uh, that, uh, uh, nearly abuts it. There's a little hop over we're gonna have to make there. Main trunk fiber accessibility, very important. Um, the data tax incentive laws have been passed and are in place, and the last is why we're here tonight, local cooperative regulation to be able to get it cited. Next one, please, where we're still in that. Okay, we can go quickly on this slide. The folks in back of me have it, but this was a political support. I just want to tell you that 90, uh, 91 percent of the House, 86 percent of the Senate voted for this only because they understood that infrastructure is necessary and they see this coming in a need, for, a need in the state of Connecticut. You can go to the next slide, whoever's got the trigger. Okay, these are the municipal be benefits. Uh, I didn't choose the little revenue benefits uh, piggy up there. Um, uh, we laughed about it when we saw it the other day. Uh, so um, aggregate payments to the town of Killingly are $165 million based on the host fee payment schedule. It averages around $5.5 million per annum. It is a uh, combination of fees and um, escalators and one-time payments that come 157, I'm sorry, 1510, 15, 25 uh, years uh, uh, out. Uh, but it averages 5.5 uh, million. Also, and I don't know if I have it here, but um, it's present on this slide, perhaps it'll be on a future one, but all the permits are paid at full rate. And uh, those are some very substantial fees. We also will provide, uh, and we, uh, we have this outlined in the host fee agreement, uh, we will provide a person that works for the town of Killingly that our operation will pay uh, to coordinate as a, a, a clerk of the works is not exactly the right idea, but uh, it, it's generally what they would do. They coordinate between us, the construction company in the town, and all the permitting and so forth, but they would work at the best interest of the town and would work at the direction of the town. Um, we would choose them. Uh, we, would, we would mutually choose that, that person to come in. It'll take uh, some, it'll take really all the pressure on this particular build off the town because you'd have a coordinator and basically someone to liaison with the building inspectors. Um, let's see what else we have here. We've covered um, low demand on municipal resources. Uh, we are going to need some water. Um, it's like filling a swimming pool. Once you fill it, it's filled. Um, it then needs to be topped off now and then. Same kind of idea with a data center. We're going to fill it up. Uh, we are unsure at this time what other uh, upgrades may or may not have to be brought in. We're unsure at this time how much water we'll use. It really depends on what finally gets approved so we can figure the square footage and get the cooling designed with the engineers. It's actually, it's a, it's a big process. So we don't know those numbers yet. Um, the uh, opportunity magnet for future commercial growth in the community, extremely important. People underestimate this and they want guarantees. If you go and read into all of the areas, Dallas, Austin, Seattle, Sacramento, uh, of course, San Jose, in these areas, you're gonna see that wherever data center cited, uh, office space was taken, uh, research labs were located, all this uh, gets, gets pulled together. There'll be a lot of contractors taking space at first, large scale contractors that come in, especially operate uh, electrical engineers, switch gear uh, uh, suppliers and so forth. They'll also need warehouse space regionally, somewhere hopefully in Killingly, uh, but they'll, they'll need that to be able to uh, build the, the, the property. Um, the development project has budgets for all of the additional expenses. In other words, anything that is affects that site is paid for by the developer. If a water main had to be upgraded, for example, and a road, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, penetrated, that's the expense of the developer. We don't have those answers yet, and we won't. Uh, and there is 
no cost for anything we're doing passed on to utility customers. Um, uh, it has nothing to do with the regular rate. This is an industrial project, so those are all separately. Uh, those are all separate within the uh, within the network. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, this is an example from our architects of what a building could look like, okay? We haven't gotten the square footage all figured out yet, but this is kind of what it looks like. That white might be gray, but that is a two-story data center. It's about 50 feet. That's probably what we're going to see here. Uh, the stone wall probably doesn't apply to this site, but it's just, a, you know, a graphic. But this will give you an idea of the massing. You can see the people in front of it. This is what a data center looks like. Now, if you look at the side of it, or if you look at this brochure that you have in your hand, this, this one in the back here, this back view is really what a data center is. It's just a box there. Um, you'll see a truck backed in. That's for unloading the servers. They unload them in, in obviously dry conditions underneath an, a pass so everything stays nice and clean and dry. A couple of facts on here is a 24% lot coverage on 72 acres. We don't know if there will be more or less lot coverage. We have to get our stormwater runoff taken care of, our surveys and so forth. All of those things have to be done. So that may change, but based on what we're proposing, that's approximately the math. Next slide, please. Hang on a second, if I may. Yeah. Um, just want to clarify. So the uh, 50 foot is to the top of the roof line. The parapet is above that, correct? That's right. So the how tall would be the parapet above? Well, that? we don't know uh, yet. It, it could be as high as 12 feet or more. But likely, if we have the sound attenuation over the air conditioning units it would just be high enough to cover that. In other words, there's two levels of sound attenuation. Putting a wall around the outside is one way. But if you really want to sound attenuate, they have these things with louvers that go right over the air conditioning units and there's all computational fluid dynamic studies done and so forth to figure out if they can breathe enough to operate at full capacity. And then you make that wall after you've, after you've used either um, a train or Johnson or whichever air conditioning is available and can meet our sound attenuation, these boxes get built and once that engineering is designed with the box over it, some boxes are two or three feet above the air conditioning because they need to breathe, then we'll know the height of that wall but we don't know yet and we won't know for a while until we come in to see you with some designs. Thank you. I just wanted to get a rough estimation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, energy efficient building, we've already talked about the other two up here, the third bullet point here. Um, in the host fee agreement, there is a number of energy efficient building industry standards uh, that uh, are available to be used. We will be having the architects spec all that and we will be bringing it to the town and you'll be able to review the green energy standards for the building. Uh, when you build a data center, every it's like, it's like buying an Apple Watch or something. Everyone wants the latest one. So they're going to have this thing built up to the most green standard and it's not because we have anything to do with it. It's going to be the board of the finance uh, arm of this thing has, has certain regulations and they're going to want a totally green building. So the, the only thing that we're going to uh, just uh, let you know is it may take up to a year to fill the building, which means we can't get our final sign off until the building's full. You can't get a, a PUE rating until there's enough people in the building to make the math work. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick show for the fiber. You see Killingly up there in the right-hand corner. Um, uh, main trunk is down, it, um, uh, is down there at 95. And you can see, obviously, we all know 395 cuts in. And that's the way the fiber would go in that direction. The other way would be north and century, uh, uh, I'm sorry, windstream would carry it east out toward the Boston area way. So it's, it's a pretty good location. Six doesn't have much in it for high-level fiber, uh, has some, but um, we'll be able to, uh, uh, 395 is our goal to get into the primary trunk. Two ways overseas lines, one through Boston and one through uh, New York, another, I'm sorry, third one through New Jersey. You can switch the slide. If we have another slide, I just, is that it? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. The killing the site plan. Okay. Please don't consider this a real site plan. This is just a box on paper rendition of what could be. The conservation land is all to the left. I know it's hard to see here. It might be easier to see in this brochure. It's got little uh, hash marks over the conservation area. 
um, you can see that the power plant is next door and there is a power pad uh, uh, next to the power plant to the north and then just north of that is a black pad. That black pad is oversized on purpose. It's probably going to be approximately half that size. That would be the substation for those buildings that are there. Uh, it could be that we divide that substation up into two for redundancy, the architects are saying, in case of a lightning strike or anything else, they want to have redundancy. You'll also see that um, you're pretty close here to 395. That's where we need to jump in on the fiber, and the power runs right through the middle of the site. Um, these buildings are likely, I'm just going to tell you now, likely to come down in size. We are going to need stormwater runoff. The roofs are big. We have to plan all that. There might be some uh, stormwater runoff. Uh, depending on how the engineers handle the process uh, to the right side of the top building in that area there or to the t or the top side of the um, top building and there will be infiltrators under the roads that will all be built up to you know uh, uh, a spec level uh, very high spec level and it will be uh, deep will be looking at this for stormwater runoff so it'll all have to be you know perfect at, perfect plus you'll see that there are some roads around those roads are so tractor trailers can make the turns with the servers but when the cars come in you're going to see that they're going to just be in front of the building and it's an average in, in this in this scenario you're looking at there's probably a dozen cars per building per shift in the in this scenario maybe maybe 12 or 13 cars something like that per shift on average Next, Nick. Just curious, you, um, for order of um, construction, are you looking at constructing the rear one initially, or do you have any? So we're talking to the architects about that. Um, the 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 shape of the land uh, is uh, al allows a larger building. We'll have to. Well, we would like to do it that way because it provides a staging area. We don't have to. You know, getting around those first two buildings will be difficult. Uh, the it's very likely according to both the architects and Turner construction that we might build the uh, building in the back and then build the two buildings at the same time that are closer uh, to Alexander because they can't have vibration in these buildings once they're set so they're thinking it's far enough away for the the one that's on the quarry side and then the other two may be constructed simultaneously but we won't know yet until we get you know, into permitting and so forth with planning and zoning. <clears throat> Is there another one in there? Oh, okay, oh, the fact sheets. Okay, uh, they, we'll go through these really quick. Um, three buildings, uh, the sizes are gonna change. I can tell you almost certainly now the sizes will come down a little bit, maybe as much as 10% because of the stormwater runoff considerations. Um, sound attenuation used to be ignored. I can tell you in North Virginia, it's like 74 decibels, pretty darn loud in North Virginia. Here it's 54 in the state. It's gonna be much quieter than that and it's gonna be at ambient sound level for that area. Um, uh, the, uh, it's far from residential use. It's in your industrial park. As we said, no peak shaving. But if it, people don't know what peak shaving is, it's running generators to make electricity to use within the data center. We're not having any of that. So there is zero emissions on this site, zero. There's no emissions. Uh, we know the uh, post fee payment already, so if you could go to the next slide. <clears throat> Electrical upgrades and infrastructure. This is what we talk about when we talk about going to uh, Pura and so forth and working through the process. We're going to need substation approval. Um, you know, ISO will be involved and so forth to get, the, uh, to get this done. Uh, it, there'll be uh, no cost to the ratepayers. Um, we have this estimate planned March 2026, approximately 50 megawatts. And in 2027, it'll probably blossom uh, to more than that. But we're going to need to start with approximately that many and approximately that date. And it's uh, and we're going to have to be subject to, to uh, uh, you know, forward capacity markets and all of those things and timings for those. Closed loop building design, water sewer upgrades. Uh, sewer, um, very little sewer here. It's basically bathrooms. Excuse me, basically bathrooms similar to this building. Uh, there would be very little use. Uh, we don't think there'll probably be any upgrades for that, but uh, again, at our expense if there are. And uh, inland wetlands and full permits we've covered. So I think we're close. Um, One more. 
Okay, and then, the, oh, the last one, important for knowing, yes, I, you know, I've been through Killingly, and I see you got a lot of build, big buildings, and you've dealt with a lot of construction, obviously, before. This is going to be another one. We're hoping it's two construction periods, uh, one for the back building, which should be a little less painless uh, because we have, we would have, plenty of staging area in front, many acres of staging, and that land's already cleared. So there would be plenty of places to put trucks and steel and car and cranes and so forth. It would be off the, off the road. When we get to the last building, we may have to rent a space off to, to, to store the materials in and bring them in. Single-use site. We're not, only, you know, we're not using it for anything else. There will be some offices within the building, but it's not an office building. The offices are conference rooms and, 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 uh, and small offices that you would use for the electrical engineers engineers and so forth. Some of the offices only get used once a month when people that own the equipment that's in a particular bay come, but they have an office there uh, when they come in. The bigger, the bigger um, uh, uptakes of space, they'll have to get their own local offices. If they have more than, you know, a dozen racks, they'll have an office here locally sometime. Uh, con expected critical construction is about right, 11 to 13. These used to be 18 months, but they're going pretty fast now. Um, and uh, a quick on the construction from our last time, uh, it will likely be um, concrete panelized buildings because of the shape of the land. Those panels will be built off-site, bring in and stood. Um, all state and federal regulations at all times uh, and contingent on the purchase and sale for the piece under the power lines. Um, I think I've covered everything. Is there any questions? Mr. Grandelsky. You were talking about the uh, stormwater runoff. Um, all the runoff is going to be contained within the site or there's going to be some runoff like to the Quinnebog River or to the off site? So it will depend. I, I don't do that for a living, and we've discussed it only briefly, but it will have to conform to state standards. It's got to go to deep. So I can tell you on another site we're on, the, the, you know, the st state requires the first inch of rainwater on the roof has to be stored basically above ground in a pool like you see at shopping malls and everything else. They want it stored so it can sit and slowly leach into the ground close to from where the rain fell. Then the storm water would be the burst. If we get a few inches of rain, we have to either add infiltrators for that to keep it on site. This will all be a discussion when we get to conservation. We'll have the engineer, we'll bring in the engineers and so forth and work with the town on the storm water. But there will be areas around some of these buildings, some of them maybe half as wide as this room and long, that'll be those roof runoff areas. It'll all comply to state standards. They're gonna be looking at pretty closely at deep, so we'll make sure that we have it. But some of our recent developments with new buildings there, everything, there was no off-site runoff, it was all on-site. We right? can retain everything on-site. It's just a question of how deep, you're in the construction business, right? Some degree, yeah. Okay, so you understand the big infiltrator systems, right? right, right. You can go down with a three-layer building, you know, and build, dig down 20 or 30 feet, but there's a lot of rock out there. So we don't have geology studies yet. We have to do all of this. So we're gonna have to get the geotechs out to do some drilling and figure out, you know, where things are before we design the water. We got to do some oh, geotech, yeah, I'm not, right? Yeah, I'm not so no, I'm just telling you. But yes, we can store everything on the site. It's a question of how how many layers of infiltrators okay. we have to put in and how much stone has to be brought in. There's plenty there. That's what they do there now. They crush stone. So we'll we'll see how that looks. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, you were also talking about the, um, the, the infrastructure on 95, uh, the fiber infrastructure. Well, however far that is away, um, is that going to have to trans go over private property, other property, eminent domain? Um, None of that. Okay. We have to still, undetermined, we have to get from the site to the highway. Well, I, that, okay. But as long as we get to that highway, we're good. Now, what will happen is we'll get to the highway, and they have these switch boxes like Verizon does and so forth and Comcast and other states, you know. And we'll have to get to one of those boxes because that's below ground. That's where you tie in. You can't splice it in anywhere because it slows it down and people get awful mad. Yep. So you have to get So we'll get to the highway, and we'll go left or right, and we'll get to one of these stations. It could be a half a mile away or something. It's all part of the permitting process. <clears throat> we won't do that. 
we'll contract with a fiber company and the fiber company does this. And we then, this is normal in the industry, data center operators don't install their own fiber. They contract with a fiber company, they do all of the work. The data operators provide the pathways if they don't already have them, and then, which we'll have because we're so close, and then it will go to main trunk. It's only probably going to be, and we don't know because it's not tested, but we're guessing, it's three milliseconds from Boston to New York and on published national sites. We think it's going to be a tenth of a millisecond to get on 395 down to 95, and then you have a lot of different fiber there. Also, I'm quite sure that We've already been approached by four now or five companies that want to get the jump on providing the fiber. There's also fiber in 395, undetermined completely yet, that is dark fiber that has been installed years ago and never lit. So it's basically a secondary. So we don't know what quality that is. That's going to have to be tested to see if that's going to be viable. And we'll have to work with the fiber companies, and then they would want a lease signed for 30 years or some period of time with escalators, just like you're renting a, an apartment. They want, they want to lease side. And then they'll do all those hookups for you. We're responsible from the edge of the property line in on fiber, and that's like where Corning comes in. They bring in that, and they, they have the, the fiber switch gear and the gear within the building. It's a different company. What about the, now this is, you're gonna have a, a battery, you're gonna run off of basically run off of batteries for not interruption, but the batteries will be permanently ch charged. Is that? That's right. All data centers basically run through the batteries in case there's a power glitch. It doesn't upset all of those servers that we showed you in the first slide, right? So the batteries are in there. When those batteries get switched out, brokers come in to buy them. There's, it's a big bidding process. They, when they buy these for recycle, and they take them out by the tractor trailer load, and they bring them in. So they do run through batteries for the most part. These are big batteries. They're six foot tall by you know this wide, and they roll them in on carts and so forth and hook them up. Before you respond to that, um, just because of rules of procedure for the meeting, um, we will get to the point where um, we have public comment that would be after this. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we're getting back to the batteries. Now, yes. Um, is there a chance of batteries blowing up or something like that, or you know, the fire suppression system? I mean, we have some fire department people here. I don't know. Um, Training for them, uh, batteries is a whole new arena uh, from what I'm hearing. I don't, I don't know how, how up to date or what we do So those folks. The architects, speak. we've talked to the architects about this uh, at length. They have built um, 90, I think, data centers so far. The fire suppression systems, are, they've been in North Virginia, California, where it's a lot more strict than it is in Connecticut. Um, the uh, fire, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that much about fire suppression, but they're built to the ex extremely high standards. The building's concrete. Uh, it's gonna be hard for anything to get out of that building at the time. And the people, in, the people that are renting rent based on the quality of the build out of the building. So you want the very best quality. So I, I, don't, I don't really know anything about the names of the fire suppression systems, but I've been to data centers that have fire suppression systems. You don't even see them in the data center. It's not sprinklers on the roof. No water. There's no water. So um, obviously, it's all electric. So uh, I, I can't answer that question, but the, uh, the fire department will certainly have all the specs from the architect. The architects will meet with the fire department and explain all this, the, the, you know, the, the parts of it. They have a fire engineer, of course, that signs off. Uh, the belt and suspenders approach on a controlled job like this is that the fire department will be there to inspect and then the engineers stamp the plan and stamp the finished installation so the town knows that the engineers are responsible for all of that. It'll be a built up police. The thing here with this in the town here, the town is not responsible for the fire. The, 
the fire departments are totally, it's a separate entity. I remember that. So it's kind of difficult. I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, we have like five different fire districts or six districts. And it's um, just to make sure that it, when it comes to the town side, that the, the fire districts do get their representation as to this whole process. Yeah, you've got a lot of big buildings in Killingly, huge buildings here, big distribution center. I can tell you without hesitation, this will be the most sophisticated fire safety system I'm you sure, have I'm sure. anywhere in Killingly or probably anywhere in Connecticut with one exception, and that's equal to the UBS data center at 250,000 square feet. That's the only other one that would be close. There won't be anything else, but that's a good question. Is there, is there any chance of a, of a, if there's a power interruption or something like that, a, a large scale, how would that affect? Because you have the batteries, what is the, the time frame that you can run on batteries? It depends on how many you put in and it depends on the customer. So generally this is how this works. We have to get through the first land planning part and then what'll happen is we will start to speak to people, which we're actually doing now, but they don't want to talk to you until you've got enough meat on the bone, right? And then what'll happen is we'll try to figure out how to place tenants between the buildings. So one building could take a lot less electricity per square foot than another building because a particular provider uses watts per foot. They don't, you don't rent space like a, like a by the square foot right, in the right, data center. Yeah. It's all watts per foot. So you could have one that uses 80 or 90 or 100 watts a foot. You could have another that uses 250 watts per foot. You don't know until you talk to the customer. And then they, they have, their boards have, the, the tenants' boards have specific requirements for their proprietary thing. So a server isn't a server isn't a server. All of these, all of these servers for these different companies are built just slightly differently, almost no two are alike. So they have these, these servers, they have their own backup, they have their own switch gear, they have their own engineering design, they have their own design for those blue racks I showed you the first thing. They have all their own stuff. So if they, if, if a company like, uh, a co-location company like Digital, Digital or Equinix come in and they put the cage in, they have all their own stuff, they're gonna want their own battery backup. They're gonna want their own air conditioning in that part of the building. Let's say they take 10,000 square feet that one air conditioning unit would service that unit. They call them pods. So when we go forward here, when we're designing the building, a few things happen at the same time. We start to talk to some of the tenants and we design around what the industry is gonna want, at least for the first building, and then we can adjust on the second because we're gonna have, let's say the first building is uh, 100,000 100, square feet. The pod, there's 10 pods at, you know, at, at 10,000. We've got to figure that out, and then the air conditioning units are decided from the pod design within it. So there's, there are a ton of unknowns, and I, will, I can answer them as we go along, and I can provide the info as we, as we go forward, but I wouldn't be able to even tell you though, that until we have, like, shell approval for that, because we need to know the actual size and, you know, engineering space for that shell, and then we would have to then look to see in the supply chain, what air conditioners are available. Some are two years out. Switch gear is two years out. Transformers are two years out. So we've got to get, we want to push this pretty quickly. It's very, there's a lot of interest right now in Connecticut, quite honestly, and we want to see if we can push this out to the forefront, but we're going to need to, um, we're going to need to get through some basic approvals first. And those basic approvals are this, um, we're going to have to get a power purchase agreement uh, inked. We're going to have to get um, uh, confirmation on our zoning. We're going to have to get a uh, inland wetlands, I think the biggest one at the beginning, so everyone's comfortable within the town and something deep would approve for inland wetlands. And then from there, we can throw everybody else in and get the rest of the work done. So we're going to need A2 surveys. We're going to need to have... Um, uh, you know, all these other things that we talked about. Archaeological work has to be done on the site. I don't expect much archaeological interest here because the front lot's been backfilled. It's been dug up in the middle by CLNP years ago, and in the backside there's a quarry. So I don't see we're finding much here on the archaeological, but it's required by SHPO at the state. Over five acres you have to have a dig. I don't know if you know this, but it's 
it's um, a lot of digging. It's, uh, it's um, you know, hundreds of penetrations I'll have to make out there to meet the state uh, SHPO requirement. And about how far away are you going to be getting your power from? Is it going to be close or is it yeah, going to right be there. the grid? Yeah, we're going to be right there. Yeah, but you're in the power lines, but I mean, as far well, as... Well, it's going to go, if you go back to that slide, we'll take it to, we'll take the power to that black back dot substation. And... But I, uh, not, not so much that, but the distance, who you're buying the power from, what is the distance to get to your site? Don't know exactly. I don't have the engineering on that, but it doesn't really matter as long as we can uh, get it. Everything I see, ISO New England, all this, uh, you know, the grid. Can the grid handle this? That, uh, that's my. Okay, I'm so sure. let let me just say this to everybody that's in the room about the grid. You can go on real time ISO New England charts. I encourage you to go look at it. We're using. I didn't look today, but we're using approximately. I'd say uh, 38 or 9, 8, 38% of all the energy in the capacity that we have in New England. That's it, that's all we're using. Gas prices went from 7 cents down to 1 cent about a month ago to 1.77 cents. So gas prices are ridiculously inexpensive. We know that there's nuclear blended in, okay? Um, the power cost, uh, the bid for power, has been two and a half cents. What are you paying at home? 10 times that, more? Two and a half cents, that's a wholesale price of electricity. Don't take it from me, just go on the website. The, ICE, well, the, the go reason on the website. I, I'm throwing that out because um, Christmas Eve, there was not enough power in New England because we could not get gas for power to power plants. Okay. So I, that's just a, an aside. That's probably not gonna happen again. Look, I, 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 don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get into uh, pointing fingers and things, but there's, there's, the gas is stabilized, first of all, um, and it's plentiful, and um, New York is the major curb stop for Connecticut. You know that, right? New York decides if how much gas they're taking, and we get whatever's left over. That's how it works. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. So. New York now is going to no more gas stoves, no more buildings built with gas heating. They're going to, guess what? We're going to have a lot more gas, a lot more. And guess what's going to happen? Price is going to go down. Mm -hmm. The pipes are installed. People say they're not big enough. Yes, big enough for residential expansion and subdivisions. Most areas, like I worked on the Cape for 30 years, we had moratoriums on gas because there wasn't enough gas getting there. Okay, But that's changed now. So yes, we have plenty of energy in New England. If you don't like to hear that, go to the charts and look at it for yourself. Every day there's seven or 8,000 megawa megawatts that are available for sale every single day in the, in the markets. Take a look for yourself. And the prices are extremely low right now in New England. Distribution's a different thing. That's the wholesale cost of the power. Distribution's expensive. And, um, but have a good look at that because it really makes a difference. All the charts are there. It shows you what everybody's providing to the grid in real time, minute to minute. I was walking my dog about two months ago. If you remember, it was hot for a day or two. It got really hot for a day or two a couple months ago, unusually hot. And I whipped my phone out and I looked. Energy prices were minus four cents, minus four cents. How does that happen? It happens, it happens. So. Well, I you're mean, closer to it than we are, you know. I understand, but I'm giving you yeah, some tools. Well, no, that's why I, that's but to answer the energy question, there is plenty of power in New England. Not everywhere. If you go to northern Maine, up near, you know, Flagstaff, there might not be. But in this region, there's plenty of power and plenty of connectivity for electricity. And Killingly has got a whopper amount of power. It just happens to be. Yeah. That's why we came here. Um, as far as the power side, um, going back to all the information that was brought to the town by um, NTE Energy as well as uh, um, everything that's available out there for people to research, uh, and the fact that when NTE first, uh, their permit got denied by DEP, it was based off of proving that there wasn't a need for another power plant 
and it was proven that there is plenty of power in the area. Sure. So that in itself goes to show um, that, that there is power out there, um, w without a doubt. Um, and uh, the other question I did have is when you had spoke about uh, the employee that would be a town employee that you were going to reimburse the town for who's going to be in a sense the liaison between um, the town and the construction um, is that how long are you going to be paying for that employee or is it going to be just during the construction period um, no it's in the it'll start at the beginning of the construction period once we get a building permit and it'll run for five years okay we're going to contract that person for five years, and I think we've put, I think the lawyers put in a benefit package too, so it'll be a full package for somebody. Um, we hope it doesn't take five years. <laughs> but what will happen is once you build a shell building and we bring in the first big tenants, these are huge buildings. There's still more interior build out to do down the road. So what we're hoping to do is ease through the process. That's why five years, because there'll be basic build outs. There'll be electrical inspections and all these things as you pr build out the pods that we talked about, right? But we're hoping that we get a big chunk to come in, and most of the work will be done. And by the end of five years, the rhythm will be set. And, uh, um, you know, if not, we'll, we can talk again about that. But I think we'll be done within, with, all, with all the buildings within five years, um, assuming it doesn't take too long to get yeah. through the first stage. My reason for asking was just thinking about if the town hires an employee, we have them for X amount of years now. If that position no longer exists, then we have an employee that we either have to retain, find another position for, or someone we would have to let go at that point. Um, I don't know. If I may, if we would can. also potentially just contract. So it may just be a contractor okay. and not an employee. Right. Okay. It would be a contractor for whatever duration of time that we are, that's needed for. So it's an either or situation. Okay. So Would it depends like on what's best suited um, and it would be a duration um, um, period we okay. it's specific task oriented okay. we've been talking to uh, two big companies um, and uh, Turner construction about finding that person because that person's really important um, we're trying to find someone that's retiring or close to retiring from the data industry that does this at the data industry because this isn't, you don't, if someone went to school, for example, for project management and tried to do this, they might be able to do it, but not at the level that a data, you got you to know all about the switch gear transformers. You got to be able to speak the language when the customers come in. You've got to be able to work with them and, there's, and, and understand what their needs are and how many you know, watts per foot are going to be available and how it translates and what the build-out is and what the setbacks from the cages are, you know, their secure areas, air conditioning they're going to need to know about. So we'd like to be obviously involved in that process and, and help bring in maybe some of the candidates and then the town would interview them and see if they, they, they work that, that process through. Thank you. Mm, thank you. On, your, on the interior building, Mike, the, as the data centers progress, yeah. do the racks get taller or good question change really good question okay so in this first picture if you folks can see it here if you look up at the top there's a whole lot of space up top up there and the reason they do that is the cooling system so they have hot lanes and cold lanes this lane where you can touch the computers from the front those are the cold lanes it's like 30 or 40 degrees cooler in that lane the hot lanes are between the back of the servers where all the electrical wires come out okay and what they do is they shoot the air, suck it down on the hot, and they pull it through the air can and up, up through the system, and they get it through, and then they pump it into the cool lanes and cool it down. So they're constantly rotating the air. So as far as far further permits go, all that duct work and all that, all that work has to be done once you get the tenant configuration in there and then you do the interior build out. So there are really no devise, de, devise, devising walls there. That's, it's really just, um, they cage it sometime if they're within the same pod. If there's a different pod, then there are the interior walls that come with the original build. So there, there's, a consistent, there's a consistent space within the industry? Yes. Yeah, so, maybe that's the point that I'm getting. Okay, so for height, height, more height, height is 14 feet. This isn't 14 feet. 14 feet, is the industry standard not less they like it a little bit more so we're going to be at 50 feet to the plate to the roof edge right so 14 and 14 on a two-story building is only 28 feet people say well what do you do with the rest of the space 
The floors are carrying 100,000 servers. You need to have a well-built floor. Yep. Those floors are very thick. Plus, these are raised floor data centers, so the, the, the electricity components, we well, don't see any transformers here. All that stuff is under the floors. So you build the floor, and not a basement, but a raised floor, and all of that gear is there, and that gear services this. So you've got that height, you've got the between the floor height, and you have 14-foot floors, and if you do the math, it gets there pretty quick. Plus, the roof structure is tremendous because it's carrying all the weight of all those air conditioners and a couple acres of rain and snow. So it's a huge steel truss roof system. Um, on a full build out, like uh, say we did a full build out um, on a comparable sized uh, project, do you have a estimate of how many gallons you would need to top off? I don't know that, and we won't know that until we until we um, get to square footage numbers. And it depends. Different systems require different amount of gallons of water. We don't know, but I can tell you that we're confident that you'll be happy when you find out how little it uses compared to, compared to um, other cooling systems that are used in the south. There's plenty of water, for example, at Tennessee Valley Authority, so they use an evaporative system, and they go through millions of gallons of water a day. No, I was just curious this if is you gonna be, had something existing no, I to don't, compare it, it to at the moment. They're all different, and if, and if you got a number, it could be, you know, if we were gonna estimate a, a closed loop it could be that the building isn't full. So the architect could say, well, I've got one here in North Virginia, but it's at, you know, 74% capacity and we're using this much water. They can't tell you really until all the systems drop. They can, they can give you an estimate once equipment's selected um, and ready to, you know, before the installation, they'll give us an estimate. And I hope well enough in advance because we're gonna need that. As far as the regular water needed for you know, bathrooms and clean up and so forth. It's minimal, minimal, yep. But we don't know the numbers yet. Now, when you have to do a top off, is that something that happens all at once um, where it's topped off within a short period of time or is that something that takes a couple days, couple weeks where you're drawing for a longer as period rather than As long as something's broken down, um, it's, it's maybe slow, constant, draw I don't exactly have the timing for that but yeah it's good you're going to re, it's going to be topped up it's not going to be a swimming pool full of water it's going to be enough to top off a closed loop system um, you know that even home systems that are closed loop you lose some of the either water or glycol mix that's in the system this is going to be exactly that same process you'll lose a little percentage and you'll fill it up and top it off and it's all done automatically the system knows that it needs water and a valve opens and it puts the water in. But we'll get you all those calculations and and, um, and uh, do whatever we have to do to get the water to where it needs to go. So we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, I just want to add one thing to that. Sure. Um, for those who weren't around when the whole NTE thing came through, uh, Connecticut Water did come forward. And at that point, they had given us figures as far as what they, what they had available um and they were going to have to tie in two other well fields in order to be able to to be able to supply nte and the number they were requiring was substantial and even though they didn't come in connecticut water has already done um the interconnects between the other well fields so at this point we have substantially more water than we did available to the area um than we did uh, roughly six years ago if you picture this space that's open in front of us and you cut it in half, that's about the size of a condenser, two condensers. So let's say they're building this thing in the roof and we have one pod out of 10 in a building rented, that one would be commissioned at that time. So you're not filling an Olympic sized pool. Yeah. You're filling a little bit at a time, you're cooling the space, they're testing it, it takes days to test it, they gotta get the temperature up, they've gotta slowly load the servers, then they adjust the thermostat basically, I'm making it simple, but they adjust it as the servers go in, and it's all a process. And then, if you have another space, so it's not gonna be a big draw uh, overall in the system. Yes, we will need water to get the system going. Now, if we get a hyperscaler that is gonna take the entire building, that's a different thing, but it doesn't all have to fill up in a day. It can fill up over a period of a month because you can't get these servers in there 
that fast. In fact, it'll probably take six months to get the servers in, so they can be ramped up. And the building will be subdivided on the inside. You're going to have offices, of course, the bathrooms and so forth, and you're going to have these data halls. And there's going to be demising walls, even if one person takes the whole thing, you're going to have some demising walls within that data hall. Uh, so it gives you options in the future to do it. Also, they have different types of servers. Some servers run hotter than other servers. They group those together. The temperature, it's a little more expensive to run in that area, and they leave the cooler ones. They don't mix them. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You were talking about uh, concrete palletized uh, panelized walls. The last time you were here, you were looking at doing them on site, and I thought you said you were going to be doing them off site. And we yes. talked about tilt up, uh, and tilt up is really what we'd like to do. It really depends on the geological work that we do first, and it depends on, on uh, the space that we have to build the buildings. It's a long, narrow site, right? So if we, let's say we had a company that uh, wanted to um, uh, have, have a, has a particular use, I'm just throwing names out, we're not talking to them. Let's say Equinix has a particular use for a building and wanted the middle building. But we'd have to decide at that point whether we're going to build the back building first, move to the second building, and then we'd have to decide um, how long it's going to take to, uh, or, or, or we have to decide if we're going to shell the back building to move to the front, uh, get the second building built, and give them the whole building. That building would be, um, so we have a building built and occupied in the back. We have to, that's, that's all a spreadsheet thing. We'd have to figure out if that's going to work for us. I didn't answer your question, though, I don't think, did I? Well, no, that's what I was saying, because you, we, you were talking about how much concrete you need, and there's no way the suppliers around here, right? whatever, but um, if there's going to be um, whatever building, if, if a lot of this stuff could be done off-site, there is railroad. I don't know if the railroad, if you can get a rail spur to your, any one of those sites. To yeah, have. we haven't investigated that at all, so the original plan was tilt up. Metal buildings are used everywhere. We yeah. could use a metal building. Um, I can tell you that uh, people would say, we like concrete because it's quieter. Actually, they insulate the metal just as quiet as the concrete now. So um, I, I don't know the answer to that until we do the geotech studies and see what land we have to tilt up. We may do one tilt up, the last one. We may be able to do it if we don't know yet, okay? Um, but we're going to have to have, you, you know the drill, you have to have a, a pancake surface on the inside. Questions? Questions? Um, so you're uh, aiming for three buildings. It sounds like you're financing as you go along. You know, you get somebody in, they're going to pay for the next portion of it. If you were to reach your target uh, monetarily, but nobody else bought, could we theoretically end up with two buildings, you know, less than the three? If nobody bought. You know, um, if you reach that, you reach your target monetarily, but you don't fill all the need for three buildings. Uh, I, I think it's going to work like this. I think all three buildings will be built if we have permits for them. I think all three buildings, we will have advanced reservations in some way, shape, or form for some part of the buildings. What's nice about this site, actually, is the buildings are slightly smaller than another site that we have, which would attract someone that needs a slightly smaller building. We don't have that option anywhere else. And if that particular person, and that's all, we have, there's monetary considerations, wanted a single-story building with the second floor with offices, for example, just throwing it out there, we'd be able to do something like that, too. So we have flexibility. We want to have a hyperscale data campus. There are thresholds in the legislation of $200 million and $400 million per building. So we have to decide on the buildings what tax incentive we're going to use, whether it's 20-year or 30-year. And that depends on if it's a one-story or two-story building. But I do believe that current construction costs and current megawatt costs and current um, materials costs 
that um, each of these will qualify for a tax incentive package. We just don't know at what level. We hope they'll all qualify at the higher level because it includes the land, which is, which is a smaller part of the ex expense. It also includes all of the servers. So DECD takes a, a certificate for the number of servers that it would hold, that it's designed for, and then you have five years to hand in your receipts mm. to DECD to make sure you hit the threshold. It could be, I hope it's not, but it could be that we are just close on the threshold, right? And so we have to, we have to look at that, we have to look. But I think in two-story configurations, we should more likely than not strongly more likely than not be able to qualify these at the higher 30-year level. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, uh, I want to say thank you for this presentation. And at this point, we will move on in the agenda. Uh, next item up is unfinished business for town meeting action. And now we'll move to citizen statements and petitions. Um, I know normally we just uh, we only allow for comments to be made. Um, I would entertain a motion if anyone wants to make it to suspend the rules to allow for dialogue back and forth if there's questions um, that can be answered at this time. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Ms. George. Um, discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. At this time, we're going to open up for public comment, and we have allowed for us to be able to respond back. Um, I don't know if you want to sit up at the table, so that way if there's questions you want to answer, you're at a microphone and it makes it easier. Okay. Uh, come up to the podium. You have to come to the uh, come podium. Up to the podium. Yeah. Just state your name and address, please. In, um, <laughs> while she's coming to the podium, just so you're aware, we did not receive any submitted prior to the meeting. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any written. Hi, Heather Blander for um, Frito Lay. I, I think you answered my question. It was just regarding electricity and um, usage as far as industrial, commercial in the area. Like, if there would be, you know, how much it would take, how much more is it going to cause a strain on, you know, um, businesses or industries in the area. That's all. I can tell you that it will not cause any difference to any, anyone's rates or anything else. It's an industrial rate project, obviously. There's plenty of energy in the area. It has to be managed. We have to build substations. We have to have what we need uh, to back up the, uh, the data centers. And uh, I, don't see any, I don't see any of that there. And uh, you know, we do, to answer your, other, your question, your first question, how much is it going to take? It's all about the tenants and how many watts per foot they contract for. Right. And then it translates to megawatts, and that's how much you take. And you, and you buy that electricity three years ahead, or you make okay. the deal three years ahead. So it's going to be a little bit of a process. So you put in the, in the um, papers, you put no more than 50 mega, uh, megawatts that you're going to be using during construction? No, during construction, we, we won't even use a half a megawatt okay. or a quarter and then, megawatt. But going forward, it would be 50 plus. Oh, it's going to, yeah, I think the first year would be, we would, we would try to be, we try to pull around 50. There's no reason to take more because you have to fill the buildings up with energy, with, right. with computers. Um, uh, we could use uh, a double that or more than double that on three buildings, usually a million square foot uh, or less than a million, and it's going to come down in size. The industry right now is around, the industry is 100 megawatts. We, there's, a, there's things happening, things change in the industry now. AI is a big, big deal. All these are going to be new servers, not even built yet. How so. much does 100 megawatts use? Like, if you were to say, like, in residential, how many houses would that power? I don't know exactly, but it, you can find it easy on Google. Okay. Very easy. Yeah. That was my only question. And we love your chips. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Pam McWilliams, 215 North Shore Road, Dayville. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to only ask you one. Uh, we live across the road from automatic rolls. We fought for years 
um, for the noise. First it was the trucks with the backup beepers. We finally got that resolved. They built a second level. They're very noisy. The point is, we live on a line of the industrial versus the residential for, DV, for the noise. We have to abide. We're basically sentenced for the rest of our lives listening to the industrial level noise that they put out. We have no other recourse. So that is my question when you're telling me that it's going to be quiet and you know the ventilation and how quiet can it be? Okay, I mean, so you're uh, across you're across the road from us. You mentioned there wasn't much uh, residents, and we are. We're right across the road from you. Before and sound I, travels, and it travels across yeah. water. Before I leave, I'd like you to point out exactly where you live, and I'll, or we'll sure. write it down and we'll look it up. So what we'll do is, as part of our sound attenuation, if you don't mind, if you allow us, we'll put what they call an environmental sensor there, which is sound. Of course, it's going to get you coming and going in your car and everything. Yep. But when we do it for a week, we'll be able to take a reading there, and then we'll be able to give you accurate numbers. We're doing this in other towns where other residences are. It's not a problem for us to do it. We will be at ambient levels. You're not going to hear more noise. Uh, you're not going to hear any drones or sounds. These things are covered. And also think about it. They're going to be 60, uh, 50 plus the height of the unit, 60 feet with the covering on it, right, up. Yeah. The deflectors send the sound up. It is, um, you know, you have the plant next door and you have a lot of other ambient noise there. You have the highway. Um, we're going to be lower than all of that sound, and we're going to provide the town with reports at the first level of all the readings. It's like a traffic study. So when you do a traffic study, same as sound. You go to find out when the school bus comes and when this happens and that happens, and you get all the information you need to work with. And then you try to find out how to work and integrate into that so you don't upset the flow. We're going to do the same thing with the sound. We're going to take readings out, but we'll put one at your house, if you don't mind. Will you share the data? And yeah, well, she, we're going to. We have to share it with the town. It's all in the agreement. It'll Sh all be share out it with there. us. With sure. North of course, North I will. The lake. <coughs> well, of course, yeah. It, it has to be published we are now. surrounded by noise now. Yeah, so. I know. The good news is we don't have any tractor trailers except every couple of three years, and it's random because they bring in new servers. We're just going to have cars after that. So none of the diesel sounds you'll hear, and um, the uh, uh, depending on if we get three buildings approved, it could be two and a half as compared to what we have. You know, so we'll have uh, a, a, some flexibility in number of, of servers and air conditioning uh, in, in those buildings. But most importantly, I think that with uh, knowing where you live, and uh, we've already had some engineering done to the nearest houses. I just don't know which one is yours. Uh, you're pretty far away from the site, but I understand the sound carrying over that way. So are and you- blasting. Are you to the it's north? Yeah, yeah, North Shore. Yeah, so, there's, so there is blasting. You realize that that sound's going to go away when we buy the quarry. There's not going to be any more of that. No, noise. I mean the blasting because you're building on ledge. Like oh, said, yes, there will be a period of a few weeks that they'll be doing some making noise. There's no question about it. It's going to be noisy construction during that phase. Once they get the slab down and get the, you know, they also do, they do drillings, long drillings, and, it, and they're steel and concrete. So that if the earth moves, the data center kind of you know doesn't fall off or slide anywhere. It's not like regular house footings. Once that's done, it's going to be pretty quiet. They, we're going to try to build these panels off-site, we think, and brought in. They're brought in by crane. You are going to hear the crane noise during construction. But this is a box building. Once that box is built, you're not going to be able to hear anything working going on inside that building. It's all. It's all going to be concrete, it's inside a concrete box. So there will be some uh, noise there. But we'll take care of the long-term sound attenuation with sound monitors at your house and others if they request it. As long as they're within a reasonable radius, we'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I'll get your information from Mary Colorio. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good to see you in town. It's good to uh, see a clean, a proposal for a clean facility. Uh, thank you. Very really welcome. Um, I'm a registered architect and I'm certified in 
with the International Facilities Management Association and managing facilities throughout the world. John, if you could just state name and address, please. And my name is John LaBelle. I'm at 57 Island Road, Dayville, Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. Is this a hot site, or is it a hot site, cold site? Well, uh, yeah, if you're trying to throw trick questions out, I don't know the answer. I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, you, you, um, I understand this facility to be a big box, and you're going to rent it out to people who have a need for this resource, which is an ever-growing resource throughout the country. And um, it's good to see that we might be on the front line of that. Uh, so, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I do have some questions. Um, will this facility be built in accordance with ANSI uh, best practices? Yes. So we've not. You haven't seen the host fee agreement, but it has nine, eight or nine different, uh, from Bream to uh, Energy Star to a number of different. Uh, uh, th and it, we we're going to leave that up to the town. We're going to leave that up to the town to which if they want us to use Bream, for example, we will do that. We have to ask them. The, I'm not going to be involved in that. The architects, as you know, will be involved with that. Okay. And they will come to meetings with the town and work through those those proposals. So. The questions I have with the, the follows up on Freelay's question, which is uh, in terms of power during peak power consumption periods of time, um, how will our... Uh, industrial park be impacted uh, while competing with the power you are drawing and will your facility be a priority facility in other words if there's a brownout or power um, power well, power brownout uh, is that your facility going to be a priority facility where you will not be affected by um, well demands you're and, asking uh, me shutdowns? questions so tonight is about making a financial deal with the town. The legislation says okay. that we have to do this first. You're asking me a question that requires our energy attorney in Boston, Rich May's law offices, and Eversource, and CLNP, and um, Pura, and so I can't answer that question um, yet. But uh, data centers need to run 24-7, as you know. And that's what we're trying to achieve. But we can't spend the time, effort, and money to answer these types of questions until we get through the very first level, which is tonight, and seeing if we have permission to proceed. Um, before we get to be able to answer your question, we're going to want to do the zoning, right, to make sure we can even show up there. Then we're going to want to make sure that we do a phase one, phase two, phase one, hopefully, right? We need to get the environmentals. So there's all these showstoppers before we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on electrical engineers to be able to answer your questions. So I can only answer what I can answer tonight on some of these. But yes, you know, data centers are priority for electricity if they can make it happen. It may not happen that way. We don't know. We're trying to do that. It has been in the news that we're also working with Dominion Power, as you know, probably, right? And it's a different, a little different situation there, uh, the way we're taking electricity. So uh, that's all I can really say about that because of NDAs, but uh, I'd be happy to answer these questions as things progress when we get to the point where we are able to bring in the team to do that. We have an electrical very well-known nationally electrical consultant that does data work, happens to be out of Fort Lauderdale, um, that we consult with on that side. We have 16 people on the team at this point. So I'm sorry I went on a little bit there, but I, some of the questions I might not be able to answer tonight. <coughs> but I'd be happy well, to non Non-disclosure agreements aside, I would think that questions like I have would have an impact on a financial agreement that you are hoping to make with the town. and. Um, I'm sure that with the August body we have here, they will be taking the uh, questions unasked and questions yet to be asked into consideration, and hold those as contingencies as part of the uh, as part of the agreement. Um, now, in terms of in terms of uh, there was a previous question asked about uh, fire department fire access. 
emergency uh, EMS access to the facilities. Um, there's uh, a number of different types of fire suppression systems available for these uh, types of buildings, um, including types that are harmful to first responders. Will you, as part of your agreement, uh, put into effect uh, the ability uh, for uh, the local fire department to obtain training and necessary equipment, should there be necessary uh, special equipment, um, not only initially, but also on an ongoing basis. Um, will we do, uh, yes. Will you provide for financially training for first responders from the local fire department, EMS people, et cetera, so that they respond to I understand your question a, a safe environment and they know what they're responding to and any special needs equipment. With all the high power in this facility, yeah. it's a very dangerous facility to respond to. Okay. The building permit itself mm -hmm. is going to cost around $10 million. The town's going to have enough money to train the fire department however they need to do that. We're also contributing $5.5 million a year on average for 30 years. So there's a substantial amount of money, upfront money. Also, 30 days from the building permit date is the first two and a half million dollar payment. So money's not going to be the problem to train the fire department, I don't think. It's not up to the town to train the fire department. You have a very special facility. I've had to rescue UPS units that were ready to explode. I understand the special needs and the special crew that is necessary to do that. The town is not going to train those people. You will need to train those people as a facility manager. That is your responsibility in terms of running that facility. The gear that is necessary to respond to uh, equipment that is, uh, is overheating, the, uh, the annual testing that needs to take place with all these batteries, they have to be megged out. They have to be torqued on a regular basis. That all has to be done in your facility as you run the facility. I appreciate that. Let me just tell you what I haven't had a chance to tell anybody earlier. Turner Construction, the largest data builders in the world. And they're, a, be and they're, a, good, they're a good company. They're, and I'm working with Ben Kaplan, who's senior, okay. head, he's senior head of critical development at Turner. We mm -hmm. have weekly phone calls. They're the best, okay? They are. They built multiple Facebooks. They're doing a Google now. I talked to the person, and in fact, I'm going to go see him a week from Monday down in Shelton. I think it's a week from Monday. It's on my calendar. Our architects are HED architects. Mm -hmm. They have hundreds of architects, data, data center specialists. They built for digital, Equinix, Google, Microsoft. They're, they're a pretty good deal. We're not dealing with anybody at the architect firm. We're dealing with the, the principal at the architect firm. But at the end of the day, they leave, they and we're left with Okay, we can, we can, we can, we can go down this tree of all the different uh -huh. scenarios, but I just want to tell you it's a pretty darn good team. We're talking to bringing in a level operator, some of the best in the world. We are talking to companies like CBRE and JLL. Together, they own 1,150 data centers. These guys are operational pros. So asking me a question here in the Killingly Room about how we're going to handle a hot UPS server is not something I'm really qualified to answer because I'm the developer. Well, I'm I the coordinator and I'm the political mm -hmm. side of it to put, put the pieces together. Right. And then we're going to have a pro-level operator, a pro-level architect, a pro-level builder, and this is how you put the team. Kaplan at Turner, who's done all these deals, calls it the A-team that we've put together for Connecticut. Okay? So this isn't going to be, we don't really need to go down the, 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 the rabbit hole about how or, or what type of fire suppression system. That's about a year out from now after we get some rough designs on buildings. We don't know if we're going metal, concrete. We don't know how, we don't know what insulations we're using. But there will be no PFAS type chemicals or any of that stuff in okay. any of this. Absolutely not because it has to be a green building. And we know that PFAS is not green. Well, with so. regard to that, um, why are you putting air conditioners on the roof? Where's uh, a zero carbon footprint on this? And I suppose you're probably talking about, about that. Um, are you doing heat rejection, heat uh, recovery? We are building this data center 
when we get to the point that we have the four corners of the building, the architects are then going to look at the most efficient way to make the building as green as possible. We even talked about storing roof water, but it's not going to work because many, excuse me, many states now are restricting roof water to recycle through a building. We thought we'd use that maybe as part of the take up water supply. Mm -hmm. doesn't, look, doesn't look viable. So look, the construction comments, I'm happy to have you come if you have questions when I bring the architects that are at your level, not my level, that can answer some of these questions. But I, I'm not qualified in all areas. I did the legislative piece, I put the deals together with the towns and that's what I'm doing. I put together the team of people that are, uh, that, that the pro level people, but as far as asking me these technical questions, you being an architect and me not being an architect, I can't answer all those questions. Have you also considered uh, putting in the uh, battery storage uh, that the state of Connecticut is now providing incentive for? We're not going to do any battery storage. Okay. Um, just a couple more questions and then I'll, <laughs> I'll leave. Uh, the uh, part of the uh, ANSI uh, best practices um, requirements is a chart that shows where you locate these centers. I won't go through the whole chart, uh, but there are issues on the chart, and I'll get a copy. Yeah, I'd like to see a copy of that when you get a chance. Um, that shows where you locate these facilities. Sounds like a great facility for for us, and I hope that you're successful, uh, but. But you're gonna tell me I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at the chart, and it, and it says uh, where to locate these facilities, um, and it says one mile from a railroad. It says um, five miles from an airport. It says five miles from a chemical plant. Five miles from a power plant, sorry. Um, two miles from a lake. Okay, so these are standards that you need to look at and tell us as to how you're going to comply with those suggested standards. I'm not going to comply with any of those particular standards because they don't fit the mold here, obviously. There's something going on it's, uh, that is uh, a big infrastructure push for the region. We are not here haphazardly. We have spent a few hundred thousand dollars so far to get into this room. I'm sure. Okay. We're not here haphazardly. We have a plan for the site, and it will be taken up, and it'll evolve, and you'll know more about it as we go. We have NDAs out with a, a lot of companies at this point, and you'll see, but it's going to be a viable site. I can tell you the other site that's public knowledge now in Waterford has a railroad running through it. It's next to a nuclear power facility. That's vibration. Next to a nuclear power facility, yeah. right? Right. What's in the, what's in the railway line? All the fiber, fiber. Mm -hmm. fast fiber. Right. Okay. So there are pros and cons and benefits and so forth. But here's the point: we're going to need connectivity in New England. Period. We're going to need it. It's never going to be like on that map, a blank forever. We can't sustain it. I was overseas and I was in a meeting with the guy that created the Facebook photo app, and he had a he had to take out your phones, go on, go on. I think he had us go on LinkedIn from from like Dallas. And he said, sit down when the phone loads. People were standing up for 15 seconds. How are you going to have driverless cars waiting 15 seconds? New England's not set up for any of this AI stuff, not for driverless cars, none of it. The other thing is no one in the, three, in the tri state region has an AI server yet. This may be a base for AI servers. Price is no object when you get to that part of the build. From the real estate development part in the building, yes, those are numbers. They're on a spreadsheet already. In fact, they're on about 20 pages of spreadsheets already. And they're vetted by the megawatt, they're vetted by the watts per foot, and then there's sensitivity tables that tell you how that all works, gives you balances, labels, layers of customers, and on and on. We believe this is going to work in Killing. Oh, a technical question. How if are I you prepared answer. for the supercomputers? Well, it's a pretty general question. So I am not going to decide what computers go into these. I'm going to decide mm -hmm. what tenants go in. And as the tenants go in, we have then the architects have their electrical engineers 
figure out what they need for the loads necessary to run whatever level computer they're going to run here in the, in the area. You'll see a lot of storage. You're going to see cloud use. You're going to see nodes here from some of the major companies. There's no question we're talking to them. So the location is solid because of the fiber situation. There is fiber out here on 395. We're close to 395. It goes north and south. If you make a line between New York and Boston, Killingly is kind of in that line area. Okay. There are uh, there are some there are some good benefits. Now I can tell you at the other site we're working on, we have 95 there. That's super fast fiber. Mm -hmm. We need to get to from here to 95. What we're most concerned about might be might be a tenth of a millisecond, maybe or maybe a quarter of a millisecond. It might be slower fiber to get to 95. But once we're on 95, we're on the super highway. So uh, there's also new lines. There's a new line out from. Um, Boston overseas that's going to be incredibly fast we are the eastern most data center in the entire United States so think about that for fiber speeds as long as 395 doesn't slow us down too far and we go out through Boston we might have north of New Jersey north of Jersey once you get into New York it's a clogged signal congestion there. Mm -hmm. But once you get south, you get the overseas lines, and then we got Boston in the line. So if the signal, you can lease lines to go that way. You lease lines. We also have, if you don't know, if you know this in the legislation, a 30-year exemption from financial transaction taxes. And in New Jersey, 50% of every data center megawatt is related to financial transactions. Mm. You can look it up. 50%. Now. If a financial transaction tax comes into play like the legislature proposed two years in a row, like the New York legislature provo proposed, and then they both dropped it, pretty much because of us. Because we were saying we were going to exempt it in Connecticut, and New York and New Jersey got spooked. So there's a lot of history. I've had years of driving to the legislative offices to go up. But if we have this, we could have something that's really genuinely fast overseas with no financial transaction taxes. I was invited to meet with the Bloomberg Group and so forth, having done it up at the Capitol with Ameritrade, with, with, um, with uh, um, the NASDAQ, for example. So we might have that some type of a financial opportunity here. Uh, Killingly killing may do uh, well. Sounds very promising. The last well, we're comment, working hard on it. The last comment that I have. Um, Decibels um, are one thing. Low frequency sound is another. We know. And the impact of low frequency sound on the brain's ability to sleep and reprocess while sleeping is impacted. And 50 decibels, 45 decibels <coughs> do not account for the brain's ability to refresh at night. So please, as you're making decisions on this, take into account how we can best. I know Train, they're a very good company, but those rooftop air-cooled units are noisy. And they so you can, you can buffer them, and I would plead with you. Take a note, Park Lane. Look up Park Lane in Ontario. Park Lane, Ontario? Yeah, Park Lane. Park Lane makes systems, special systems. We intend to probably use Park Lane. We have to make sure that when we need them, they can do it. it take, you have to order the Park Lane suppressing equipment at the same time you order the air conditioning units. Up in that region, they manufacture both Train and Johnson controls. Those are the two majors. We're going to okay. select one based on supply chain, and then they're going to come up. Park Lane has these. You take a look at it. Okay. We, we talked. We were in conversations with the president of the company and our architects. We had. We had a couple of weeks ago, we had, I don't know, 12 or 13 or 14 people on a, on a call. Um, you know the problems in high rises. You buy an apartment, you've got a, you've got a balcony, you walk out in the balcony, you look down, there's five air conditioning units blowing at you and making all kinds of noise. Park right. Lane fixes that. In Ontario, for example, 45 decibels is nighttime city decibel level, 45. Really? And they're less than that. Okay, so we're going to use this company. They're really one of the top ones. The architects recommended, Turner recommended it. We're going to try to use them. Now, we already have the slot board. There are other companies that do this, but they got, they've got a good, a good product that some of the higher end. You would think that all data centers need this. They don't need it in North Virginia. Decibel level, 74. Okay? No one cares. In out west, no one cares. Mm -hmm. So in cities, they care. So you have to go to a specialist 
and they're the specialists. Take a look at them. I think you'll be impressed. And it all goes to the mental health of our, I understand. Of our society. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Appreciate thank it. You for Good comments. Time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Earl McWilliams, 215 North Shore Road. I'd like to welcome you here this evening. It's a very interesting presentation. I got a very short question. It regards to it regards the construction phase. I noticed in your, your handout that the construction will take anywhere from eleven to thirteen months and 1,500 to 2,000 employees for the construction phase. Uh, is there, are they going to be arriving on shifts? Will there be like three shifts of construction? No, there won't be three shifts, no. Two shifts. Yeah, it won't be two shifts. It'll be a single shift a day. Single shift. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question I've got, as you've probably noticed, you've been up there, there's a rather complicated intersection which accesses the industrial park. Right. And as it stands, um, there are delays when companies let out their employees at the same time and whatnot. And what I'm really concerned about is how long a delay or how, how serious the complications might be for workers leaving your site and going out onto 395 or whatever. Excellent the, question. The problem being that uh, we're on North Shore Road, a lot of old people, if, uh, if that intersection is blocked off for any period of time. Emergency vehicles and whatnot would have problems getting to us or getting in and out anyway. So that, that's my main concern. Have you been able to do a traffic study yet or is that in the works? That would have to be. We can, so just I just want to say this one more time. The lead, when we went to the state and we went to Connecticut Council of Municipalities, they said we don't want you bothering towns and using up board time and people mm -hmm. unless you get a host fee agreement Okay. and get the money worked out first. That's why we're here. But no, we haven't done a traffic study. We have done it on the other site. So here's the traffic study that you're concerned about. We have to do an in-school and out-of-school traffic study. Our goal would be, before September, to get the out-of-school traffic study. Then you have to do an in-school month for traffic, and they have to rate school bus time and stops and starts. That, but, yeah. school, but the state wants they want to have the school bus study as part of this, okay? Now we get to the next step. We're going to have to look at the traffic study to identify all the issues first, right? Then <clears throat> we have to have not 2,000 cars a day, maybe two or 300 a day. A day. A day. But not cars, they're trucks, and they come in companies, so there might be 80 or 100 trucks. Now, if we build the, I know we don't have the map up, if we build the back building first, there's plenty of parking for those cars on site, and we'll have to work with the traffic with the town and figure out what time the shift starts. Yeah. So that we get the shift, an hour, everyone starts one hour before the school buses run, for example. Yeah. That's something that has to be worked out, and it's going to have to be. I mean, yeah. I mean, school buses are certainly a concern, but I remember when we were working on the NTE problem, that uh, they were talking about cycle failures and how long you may have to sit in line from a green light goes to a red light, goes I to a green light, cycle failures. And that was always an issue. And I think they were only looking at five or 600 employees for that. And so I was a little bit concerned that 1,500 to 2,000 employees that's total to over the course of the build, total different trades. So you're going to have concrete companies. When they do the pour, there'll be 20 trucks lined up when they're pouring. You know that works, right? And then there'll be cranes brought in to stand the walls. So that's, a di so, that's so many people. At, there will be days there when there's a very small amount of people, but I don't want to set you up for that because I want to set you up for the bigger number, and there, is going to, there are going to be some pretty busy days out there. Uh, we don't intend to do you know, Sunday work, Saturday, yes. We want to get it up and get it built and get it quiet. Once Certainly. the shell is built, mm -hmm. then you're going to have, you know, uh, a lot quieter site. Yeah, we're good with that. I mean, we were regling about uh, six months construction, I think, for the power plant. But this year or so, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 employees, it sounds like over time there's going to be a lot of people in and out of there. 
but it may, may not all be at the same time. It's not at the same time. Yeah. You couldn't fit them out there at the same time. No, not you wouldn't be able to do it. No, it would be just what you'd expect, concrete phase, steel phase, okay. you know, siding phase, but, it, but they're that all different traits. would be a concern of us that it would block off our, well, a lot of people's access to uh, 395 and to get there. We don't want to do that. We don't know if the shift will start, you know, once we get the once we get this together. Maybe the shift, first shift starts at 6 or 6.30 on site, so it's there before mm -hmm. the movement picks up. It ends earlier in the day, maybe 2.30. Maybe there's a shift and a half there, but we're not going to go all night with this construction. It doesn't work like that in the data center yeah. built. Yeah. We almost would hope that there would be three shifts as opposed to one shift. I know, but um, it, we, we, they, they're, they're not going to be building in three shifts. Yeah. Okay. They Thank won't you do very it. Much, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Last call for public comment. Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Uh, I want to thank you for staying and answering questions. We appreciate thank you. that. Next item up is council and staff comments. Are there any further comments from council? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is appointments to boards and commissions. 10A, Teresa Barton is seeking reappointment to the Historic District Commission. As a regular member, uh, her term would run from April 1st, 2023 through March 31st, 2028. Uh, I will entertain a motion to reappoint Ms. Barton. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski, seconded by Ms. George. Uh, discussion? Well, when she was here the other day, you saw that she was active. They had a, a program they sent out. She designed that flyer. And as a result of that, sending the flyer out to people who own some of the older homes, they got some more members. So that's good. Yeah. And seeing the fact that she didn't miss any meetings, I mean, that's, right. that's a lot. That's commitment. She's, that absolutely is. She's dedicated. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion I'm carries gonna, unanimous. Oh. I'm going to abstain because I was at that okay. meeting. We have one abstention, and that's Ms. Wakefield. Uh, motion carries. We'll now move on on the agenda. Next item up is item 10B. Uh, Rini Mazzarella is seeking reappointment to the KB Ambulance Board. As a regular member, his term would run from... May 1st of 2022 through April 30th of 2024. Uh, can I get a motion to reappoint him? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Ms. George. Is there a uh, second by Ms. Murphy? Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 I'm going to uh, abstain again. Uh, opposed? And Ms. Wakefield is abstaining. A motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 11A, uh, Board of Education Liaison. And I do not see a Board of Ed Liaison, so we'll move on to 11B, Borough Council Liaison. And we do not have a Borough Council Liaison either. So we'll move further in the agenda. Next item up is 12A, discussion and acceptance of monthly budget reports. Summary report on government appropriation for town government. Can I get a motion to accept this? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelski. <coughs> is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. George. Uh, discussion. Seeing no comments. Um, uh, maybe the question would be the status of our audit. Sure. So the, the audit is complete. I actually, I don't know if I put that in my manager report anymore or not because I don't remember anymore. So the, um, the audit is complete. Um, the audit was issued um, middle of last week. Um, they just, they were trying to get here for a presentation, but they just weren't able to pull the presentation together quick enough. Um, so that way you would have it in advance. So um, they will be presenting at your July meeting. 
Um, so the audit is, we're done and wrapped up. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? It seems overall we're doing, you know, I don't think we have any major issues. It's, I think we're doing okay. That's yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll now move on to 12B, uh, system object based on adjusted budget for the Board of Education. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? Motion has been made by Ms. Wakefield. Is there a second? Okay, seconded by Ms. Murphy. Uh, discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion abstain. carries. Uh, one abstention. Uh, Mr. Grandelski abstained. Uh, moving on in the agenda, next item up is 13 uh, correspondence communications reports. Uh, Ms. Gloria, could you go over the town manager's report, please? Yes, so um, the town was awarded um, an EPA multi-purpose grant. This is a Brownfields grant. Um, and um, we, um, it'll be conducting assessments and cleanup on uh, three sites. One is the Blueville Mill site. That one, we've already um, done a phase one and phase two, so we'd be looking to go into um, cleanup on that site. Um, as well as uh, this will begin the evaluation process for the old Danielson Borough treatment site um, for moving that one forward into um, a cleanup phase up phase for that. This is 100% um, grant funding. There's no local match to this, so there's no out of pocket from the town on this. Uh, Jill St. Clair, an economic development director, um, worked very diligently on applying for this. This is the first time. Killingly has been awarded uh, funds from EPA for brownfield cleanup. Um, and we were only one of four municipalities in the state of Connecticut that received this funding. There were only eight entities in the state of Connecticut that received the award. So um, it's a big deal. Um, I, I did uh, participate in receiving the big check. So if anybody wants to see the big check, it's actually in my office. We have a nice big check um, that I got to walk around with. But um, I, and I did let EPA know that um, this is their first down payment in Killingly. Um, we have a lot of brownfields that we want to get through, and we're very excited to be able to start partnering. So this is really being able to hopefully start to unlock those sites and get them into a, into a space that developers are um, interested in um, investing in them. You know, when there's a lot of uh, question marks around what the contamination level might be or the remediation requirements around that usually makes those sites a lot heavier lift. So um, yeah, very, uh, very big deal for Killingly and we're very happy to be able to receive that. So we'll be going through that. Part of this also, this grant also is um, the implementation of a public engagement process that will engage the neighbors around those sites into what the development redevelopment of that site might look like so it helps engage the neighborhoods as a as a public engagement process as well and just um, engage the the public in general so really great opportunity there um, some personnel updates i wanted to give you an update of where we are with regards to the wpc superintendent position that position currently still is um, vacant um, the council and the WPCA supported um, sending in a letter of support to our uh, class three operator, Joe Kuchers, request for a waiver of the written examin examination for the class four operator license. Um, unfortunately, Connecticut Deep uh, did deny that request. Um, so uh, he continues to uh, sit for the exam. We continue to advocate to the Connecticut Deep. Um, as of June 30th, um, we will be uh, considered in violation of that requirement of having a class four. That's not the first time that we have not had a class four and been in violation. We basically get told we're in violation. We continue to communicate to DEEP all of the steps that we're taking to try and atta attract or hire a class four operator and move in that direction. I will say they've been very satisfied with the operation of the plant. Um, and as long as we maintain those uh, levels of uh, 
performance, I think that we will be able to continue to have that conversation with Connecticut Deep and not necessarily see any monetary um, or detrimental um, impact on that. But uh, we just continue to advertise. And this last time around, we advertised all over the place, Boston Globe, Hartford Current, Worcester, um, the uh, Worcester Gazette, um, the National Level Association, the State Level Association, um, and we haven't attracted interest at this point in time. Um, and really, um, it just goes to show the, the it's really a dry candidacy pool. There's not really a lot of people in that pool in Connecticut. Um, in Connecticut's uh, recipro reciprocity uh, requirements, um, what we're finding, uh, they don't typically come in as a class, they don't get put in as a class four, they usually get put in, put in as a class three, and then they still have to go for the examination. So um, it is challenging, um, but we continue to go through that. Um, staff updates WPCA, the authority members at every, uh, every authority meeting on the status of that. Um, and we just will you know, continue to advocate for those extensions and work with DEEP on all of that. Um, but we will be likely getting a notice of violation um, sometime in July. Um, executive assistant, um, as you may be aware, my executive assistant took a, pos a new position elsewhere, um, and she has uh, subsequently left. Um, we The posting is currently open. Um, we've received a number of applications for that position, um, so I'll begin the review of those um, applications later on this week. Hopefully we'll be able to do interviews uh, next week and then um, get that position refilled. Um, the part-time um, individual that's been filling in in our office um, all this time. She has uh, been working in my office full time for right now. She's a shared position between two other offices. She's been covering my office full time at this point um, to try and backfill it at this point. And Kelly's been doing a great job. Um, and then I did want to let you know that we did fill the assistant revenue collector position. So we had some big changeover in our revenue collection department. Our revenue collector and assistant revenue collector both retired. Um, in March and April of this year, and they were, you know, 40-year employees. They were long-term employees here with the town. Um, <clears throat> so that's a big change within a four-person office. Um, so we were down to one and a half people in that office uh, with the hiring of our revenue collector. Um, so uh, Daniel Beltran joined us um, as our new assistant revenue collector. He has uh, seven years of experience in a similar size municipality. So uh, he really did hit the ground running. He's very familiar with our software that we currently utilize. Um, and there, there are some um, additional uh, things that they collect for revenue in our revenue office that um, he didn't have experience with, but he's very quickly um, gaining that knowledge and he's been a great addition to that team. So. Um, really happy with that selection and he's doing a fantastic job. Channel 22, um, my heartburn is, um, so um, we've been informed by um, the Board of Education, um, the server for that is actually housed at the high school. Um, we were noticing that the, we weren't getting any communication to it, um, so they did evaluate that server and uh, determined that the server had failed. So they were working on getting a replacement server. So I haven't been informed as to whether or not that has actually taken place. So um, I did adjust your agenda to only say that we were on Facebook Live because I didn't have any determination that we were actually going to be on Channel 22. So I will keep you informed as that works out. Um, but just know that that um, we have a we have a new um, issue uh, surrounding Channel 22. Um, and it's the actual server itself. So until that gets rectified, we really can't put any new content out or anything like that on Channel 22. Is there any way that we can get away from the Board of Ed with Channel no. 22 and come to the... To no. The channel 22, public service, that channel is provided for educational purposes. It's through a Board of Education. We are able to piggyback off of it. But no, we can't segregate ourselves from it. So it does have to run through their, that system. Given my interaction with the Board of Education, they do not want access. They do not want public access to anything. So, so the, the server does have to be housed there, and they do manage the overall connection. Okay. So we do, um, we do have to work with them. And they, they work with us. It's just, you know, they have to get a new server, and there's time commitment in getting that um, new equipment. 
into the into the building. So um, the Edie Prey Reservoir Dam, um, they um, just to, I left kind of the historical back information on there. The update is the um, that previous failure that we had had it got blocked up by beavers. Um, nature is a great thing. Um, so because of the sound of the running water, that's what beavers are attracted to. And so they plugged up the hole, um, which caused the water level to rise and was still jeopardizing the road. So we weren't able to reopen the road. They did get permission from deep to go in and perform the maintenance to unblock that section. Um, so the water level is now back down. Um, they have requested from deep to um, do a little bit more extensive breach at this moment to kind of assure that the beavers aren't going to be reattracted to that area and plug up the well, they're the, gonna come back. Well, well well but if they open up the if they open it up to a more uh, more of a breach they're less likely to be able to actually yeah. plug that up in a shorter time span so we would then be able to reopen the road you so talk to 4-H camp cause no i know they can block it up really yeah, fast, we block it up really <laughs> fast. <laughs> so we're hoping that we can um get that road reopened relatively quickly deep has been responsive to their requests so we know that they've been working pretty closely with them um i want to uh just report out that we um had our credit rating call with s p so standards and pores there's three credit rating agencies that um, towns get rate can, can be rated with we use uh, standards and poor um, we had a very positive interview process with them um, had a really great questions they're familiar with Killingly because we recently did financial closures closures with them around our wastewater treatment plant facility so in the last year we've gone through credit rating calls with them so it was really more of an update call for them um, so they were very pleased to hear um, the updates. Um, they are pleased with the new businesses and the business expansions that we're seeing in the community. Everything from the small business, all the different you know um, ribbon cuttings that we've had, as well as our large business expansions. Um, S&P upheld our rating of a double A plus with stable outlook. So that is a really good positive credit rating for the town of Killingly. We're very excited about that. Um, we are in the process of on Thursday, we will actually be um, doing the bond pricing. So we'll be selling the bonds on um, on this Thursday. Um, so I'll I will have more formalized uh, a payment structure at that point in time. KMS, our phase two work is moving forward. The foundation is, I think, at this point, just about complete. Um, they are going to be. They have uh, the roof trusses that are going on. So the final roof truss, they uh, usually paint it white and let everybody go and sign it. So Thursday will be the day. If you want to go and sign the roof truss at KMS um, before it gets flown up on Friday, reach out to me. I can coordinate you to be able to go out there and sign the actual. Um, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's basically from, I think we're going to be doing it from about 8 a.m. until about uh, 2.30 in the afternoon that you'll be able to go um, sign the roof truss. Uh, we're going to try and coordinate it where all the kids can go out and sign it. Um, so the kids will be able to sign the roof truss. And then on Friday, they'll fly the truss up. And so you'll get, we'll have pictures of being able to see, you know, all the signatures up on the top of the, of the building. So it's really kind of that memorializing of, you know, that, that portion of the, of the construction. So uh, it's well underway. Things have been going um, pretty well. Um, we've had some, you know, definitely we've had some supply chain impacts with regards to um, uh, electrical infrastructure um, that ended up pushing out, pushing off the uh, the cafeteria, the kitchen um, uh, upgrade that they had intended to do that this summer. That is going to have to happen next summer because of some of that electrical gear that um, has been delayed. Um, but they did, um, they have already constructed the freezer addition. So that uh, that concrete structure has has been completed on the freezer for that freezer addition. So they're making progress on that, and there's uh, great progress going on inside Westfield Avenue. We opened up bids on June 1st for the exterior envelope. So that was the roof, the windows, and the brick veneer um, repair that needs to get done. So Downs Construction right now is performing scope review analysis on the uh, low responsive bid. You know, we always have to go through and make sure that their pricing aligns with the scope and they go through a very detailed review of the scope and the project um, to vet out that that uh, that bidder. 
So we're expecting to get final reports on that in, I think, probably next week to get to the uh, Permanent Building Commission so that way they can award those contracts. We're hoping to be able to do um, brick veneer work this summer. Um, the roof and the windows will probably be the next construction cycle just because we have to order the windows. Um, and uh, the brick, the roofing component, um, there's some we have to get through a bit more of the design work on the interior side with regards to cooling units so that way we know exactly what the roof impact is going to be. So trying to get through that. Um, the next section, I gave you some updates with regards to the three legislative uh, components that I brought to your attention um, at last meeting. Um, thankfully, the um, legislation did pass um, a one-year delay on the motor vehicle property uh, taxation change. Uh, they've already started to have conversations about um, revisions that need to happen to that that'll, that the legislation will take up in their short session next year before this implementation has to take place because there is some additional um, revisions that still need to be addressed. Um, the ones with regards to changing the percentage rates for delinquent taxes, none of those passed. Those all uh, failed in the whatever respective House or, or Senate. Um, early voting legislation did pass. Um, and in the governor's budget, they do have funding, but it's for um, eligible for reimbursement expenses up to 10500 per town. So for Killingly, um, you know, this will basically, we'll be able to get through the, pri the initial um, primaries, presidential primaries, because it doesn't apply to everything. Um, so we'll have a better understanding. The state has indicated that they're willing to give additional funding for that, but they kind of needed a benchmark, I guess. So they're looking to see what that cost is going to be. Um, met, most towns have said you're, that number is going to need to get upped, but until we have the actual um, data around the true costs, that's where we're landing. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention, it's not written in this report. It just occurred towards the tail end of last week. Um, the event actually occurred earlier. Um, Owen Bell Park, um, we, there was a number of emergency services that complained to the fire marshal around um, congested parking at Owen Bell Park, more specifically down near the lower parking lot. People are just kind of haphazardly parking and it's congesting the access to that lower parking lot to the point where emergency services, if they were called, wouldn't been able to get down there at all. So um, the fire marshal has um, issued a letter to myself and um, essentially the um, major users of the park, so the school, the Little League, the, um, the soccer leagues, um, around uh, um, needing to coordinate how uh, to move forward. At this point, um, we have to go through him um, for all special event to authorize what parking. We have put up no parking signs along that throat, so that that drive that goes from by the Little League field um, to the back to the concession stand to where Raraz is, um, we've put no parking signs along that part of the drive. Um, I have informed law enforcement that they are going to need to go and enforce. You know that needs to be enforced. Um, so encouraging, don't park where there's no parking signs. Um, there's also, we've had a uh, significant problem with um, behind the concession stand, there is a gate where we have, um, we have equipment sheds, but it's also the access road to get to the soccer fields. Um, we have no parking signs there. People just park in front of it, but like five feet in front of it, thinking, I don't know, that we can still get access there. Um, so. Yeah. So um, we are going to be strictly enforcing the no parking over in that section, too. Um, so um, just reminding folks, don't where there's no parking signs, don't park there. We are, I am working with highway and with engineering to evaluate if there are ways that we can um, reimagine some of the parking to uh, increase any parking that we can down there. So for instance, where the Little League field is, Right now, a lot of people park on the grass and haphazardly on that little grassy island space. Um, maybe we can turn that into more formalized parking. Um, so people, usually when you have formalized parking, people park 
generally better than if they're just finding a green spot and they throw their car in it, right? Um, most people will stay in the line. So we're trying to just maybe get a little bit more parking by, by more formalized parking over there. Um, and the other area that we might be able to expand on is at the top parking lot, the what we call the auxiliary parking, the um, one that's a little bit set farther out, um, seeing if we could potentially expand that parking lot um, for additional parking. But again, you know, the park is very popular. There's a lot of people that go to the park. And what the biggest challenge that we find is when there is multiple sports events that are happening all at the same time. And what really, I think, brought this to the head was there was a baseball game, there was a softball game, there was, I think, um, a soccer practice that was going on. You know, there's lots of people that are using the the recreational activities there. And then Little League came for a family day as well, too. And so there's just not enough parking spaces. So people may need to have to park across the way at Killingly Commons and walk over. Um, that is a, there is a lighted crosswalk there. But um, so that's a challenge that we're trying to work through. I have already, you know, I'm reaching out to the, I've already talked to the school administration. We're going to work through that. I know that they're going to be going through a process on their side as well. So as they bring on new people, that's going to be a forefront conversation for us on how we are going to manage the upcoming fall season for sports and um, what that parking may look like and availability. So we just need to work through that so that way emergency vehicles have appropriate access to all areas of the park. So um, those were the things that I brought in. Um, I gave you um, the forms for my evaluation. There's, they should have all been in an unsealed envelope. You should be able to, um, your name is on that unsealed envelope and it's addressed to go back to Jason. So whenever he lets you know the time frame for that, that you want them back, um, everybody should have them at this point. Um, the last one that I gave you was just the draft work plan and budget for NECOG. The NECOG will be voting on this budget and work plan at our next reg at the next regular meeting. So I just wanted you to all have that for what the NECOG is considering. But all of the funding requirements that we have that are in here are reflective within our approved budget at this point. So we are good with that. Thanks. I think that's everything. Oh, on the enough. parking at, at Owen Bell Park. Yes. How are we going to phase in the ticketing? We just can't. Well, they'll give warnings. I don't know. Right. Why. Well, well I, I mean, you can give warnings to the extent that you can give warnings. But if people are parked inappropriately, if it's no parking, yeah, I, it's no parking. Right. It it's just be. like anywhere else, okay, I, right? And so we've just put up brand new signs, you know. So it's not like we're relying on old signs that have been there and everybody's been ignoring them. We just put up brand new signs. Okay. Well, maybe that's. A, that's so if there's brand new signs right there, okay. one would expect yeah. that you wouldn't be parking there. Um, and so you know they'll. You know, our law enforcement doesn't necessarily want to go out there and just throw a bunch of tickets on people's cars, right? They want to work with people and remind people, hey, you can't be parking here. But, you know, if you see somebody that's parking in a place that they're not supposed to be, you might want to remind them, hey, you probably shouldn't park there. You might get a ticket, you know, and it may happen that somebody gets a ticket. Well, I don't, you know, I don't mind tickets, but I mean, sometimes you, you want to, they've done it for so long. We want to face it in. Right. We don't want to be the bad guy. Right. But yes, we, we have to have emergency vehicles need the access. That's critical. I exactly, which is why you know we're really looking at where are those choke points? Where are the points that are really causing that problem of of limited access? And you know we've identified those. You know we've worked with the fire marshal on exactly you know how we might be able to approach that. But you know it's it's emergency vehicle access. You you have to have a hard and fast line on that. You know it's not. Well, we can park one more weekend there, right? Uh, it, no, it's I, just I, there's I, no parking, that, but, right, it's, I, and so that's why we're also trying to work with the with the um, with the heads of those various leagues, so they can get the information out to their participants too. So the 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 team members as well as the parents, which will filter it around, right? Everybody eventually gets the Im information. So well, sometimes when you go back there, there's like no way even to get out. You get right. Stuck. <laughs> right. And it's it is it is very challenging, yeah. yeah. So trying to kind of work through that and that's why we're trying to work through it now before they go into setting their game schedules for the upcoming season so that way if it does have to be like 
baseball plays this night, but softball plays the next night, right? Like we may need to stagger some of those games so they're not all happening exactly at the same time, especially if people don't want to, you know, have to park off site and walk over. Yeah, those usually park up at the top. They don't usually park down below. Those are usually up in the yeah, overflow still, park. That takes up a lot of parking spots at the top. Where they would have parked. In the in the overflow, it can, yeah, yep. So you have to kind of work through what makes sense. You know, maybe the bus goes and parks over. Right. So. So we have to kind of figure those out. But again, it's getting all the right people on the table to really kind of talk through and and get the message out to all of the all of the groups. Any further questions, comments? Seeing none, uh, thank you. And we'll move on to the agenda. Next item up is 14, <coughs> unfinished business for town council action, and we have none. So we'll move on to 15A, new business, consideration and action on a resolution, resolution setting the property tax mill rate for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. Uh, can I get a motion to uh, adopt this? So, so moved. moved. Second. Uh, motion was made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. Wakefield. Uh, discussion. Ms. Clorio, if you could go over this. Sure. So the calculation here is based on the approved budget um, for both the town and the Board of Education. Um, so that produced um, a mill rate of 26.88 as what was um, relayed during the um, reconvened a, uh, town meeting um, and uh, on the proposed budget documents that we had published on the website on the website so that's a total increase of what was it again we're at 25 14 hang on a second my brain is failing me at the moment 1.76 I think yeah any questions comments 1.74 the increase seeing none all those in favor say aye 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 opposed abstentions motion carries we'll now move on to the agenda the next item up is 15b consideration and action on a resolution authorizing the revenue collector to suspend and transfer uncollectible taxes to the suspense tax book pursuant to Connecticut general statutes. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. George. Uh, Ms. Gloria, if you could go over this. Sure. So this is an annual process. Um, one thing to um, just highlight is that we don't write the debt off. So in other words, if they become collectible at some point in time, we still collect them just means that we're no longer actively trying to pursue them so we go through a number of processes collection um, processes in order to attempt to collect it these have uh, been sitting with a collection agency for um, a number of years at this point in time um, typically we are only um, this is actually a very this is a large number that we have for um, suspense this year at 251,000 um, and that's because um, for two reasons. One, we've had uh, some tax sales that um, we have to um, discharge the remaining liens on. But secondly, this is actually reflecting a, a number of grandless years. Typically, we're only suspending one year. We usually suspend um, uh, the year that's three years, three years back. So it would be just the one year. But we had kept a number of these with a collection agency for a number of years. And so we have some grand list years that are back to 2011. Um, so this really cleans up all of that collection process, um, has them focusing on the actively collectible. These have been through lots of scrutiny to try and be able to locate the individuals. Um, or they, they may have individuals that, have been, that are now deceased or they're out of business. Um, those are all reasons that um, they would no longer be actively collected. But again, if somebody, if it's a motor vehicle, if somebody left the state and we can't locate them again, if they move back into Connecticut, anywhere in Connecticut, and they try and register a motor vehicle, they automatically get sent back to Killingly to pay their taxes. 
And we do collect on some of these suspense list ones throughout the year. Um, it's just that we're no longer actively expending resources to try and get them collected. So next year, your list will be a lot smaller because we'll only be down to one grand list year as opposed to quite a number of grand list years. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on to the agenda. Next item up is 15C, consideration and action on a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a municipal host agreement with NE Edge LLC for its proposed qualified data center. If I may, you, if you, I'm not sure if the council, well, you do have two executive session items for both of these. I don't know if the council wants to consider doing an executive session or if you feel that that's not necessary. Just wanted to um, address that at this point. If anyone would like to uh, make, make a motion I'll to. make the motion to move 17 up and in a, in a before 15 C and D. In that. Okay. All right. So there's a motion and a second discussion, and um, that was to uh, move items 17A and B up ahead of item 15C in the agenda. And D. Right. And D. In the agenda. And motion was made by Ms. Wakefield, seconded by Ms. Murphy. <coughs> and any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We will now move into executive session. You need including. You need a motion to go into executive oh. session. And who are you inviting? Okay. Yep. Jumping ahead of myself. All right. So. Uh, all right. So I will uh, entertain a motion to go into executive session, including the town manager and the town attorney. So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. Wakefield. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We are going to executive session at 919. Can we have a short break? Yeah, can we have a yes. break? <laughs> <Easy>. <laughs>